Hi everyone, and welcome back to our updates for the multigroup confirmatory factor analysis assignments for my structural equation modeling class. So just finished the video for um, kind of a class example of me working an entire multigroup with the updated code, um, which has changed because the sim tools package no longer has measurement and variance function in the same way. So I'm sort of updating this to keep up with where the code is at. And in my class, I have students do these class assignments, which are really just meant to be, can you work one of these or not? And since I've taught a lot of this online, um, I recorded myself working these assignments so they can make sure they were doing it correctly. And it's also another example for the channel. So without further ado, I'm gonna rework this assignment now with the new code. We're gonna kind of kind of live coding, which I'm not very good at, so um, please forgive my spelling. Right? So I do assume that you've watched the multi-group uh, confirmatory factor analysis example, uh, and you're here to just maybe get more. And if you haven't watched that example, that video is online and actually is a bunch of slides that work you through all of this code and give you some links to other videos if you aren't up to date with Levon. All right, so this is my assumptions. I always try to start with those just so that you know what page I'm on. So the first thing we're gonna do is use this resiliency data set. And in the other example, we looked at the differences in gender for resiliency. Now we're gonna look at the differences in race. We're gonna use this race test variable. And uh, one is black and two is white. And we actually have a bunch of other categories, um, but we these are the only two that have a large enough sample size for us to use. So the first thing I'm gonna do is import that data and make it um, appropriate. So let's get started by just calling this master. It's my favorite data set name. And that is gonna be read.csv. I don't remember the name of it. So let's see if it's here under files. Uh, that's not on the folder we're on. So let's go look at those files. Let's see if I can remember the name of this file here. Get to see my folders and folders, class assignments. Here we go. This is called 11 multigroup CFA. Okay. And let's just look at what that looks like. Okay. So we've got our sex variable we've used before. I've got my race test variable. So one and two may actually not be right. Ethnicity, which is the real coded variable where people have more options, and then all the questions. So I'm going to just run a quick table of that race test variable just to see. And it is one and two. Zero kind of became everybody else and it's not a large enough category to really do a good multi-group on. Um, that's kind of small. The 100 person black category is also a little small, but this will work as an example. So let's change that by using the factor command. So I'm gonna say factor, the name of the variable. Okay, so be careful here. I am overwriting the variable, but I can just rerun the code if I mess this up. The levels we want to keep are one and two. I'm going to drop zero. So by not including zero here under the levels command, that's going to make all of those in A. We're going to give those some pretty labels. Let's just call it black and white here. <clears throat> and then I can just check, make sure I'm doing this correctly. Let's run one more time that table. And I can see I've dropped the 52s and then um, there's a way in the table command, now I can't remember it, of course, it's off of my head, to actually show you an A's. Yeah. Excuse me. And it's um, use an A. Couldn't remember exactly what it was. And we could just do if any to see that they dropped those. NAs. So the table command automatically does not show you NAs, but if you want to see them, there is actually a argument for that. Okay, so we're going to drop all of those. And then I could also, um, just for purposes of not seeing a bunch of crazy output, tell the uh, data set to subset. So we're going to do not is an A. Okay, so remember the is an A function means is this an A? 
So if it's missing, it'll come up true. So I want to reverse this. I want to find all the valid data um, for my race test variable. This is just going to drop all of those 52 folks. Uh, so if I ran this again, now you would see that we've really gotten rid of the missing data. That's only true if you want to drop all those other lines. You're not going to use them for anything else. And uh, practically, I wouldn't do that on my own data, but uh, for the um, purposes of the assignment, well, I'm just going to make it ignore all of the giant output that you get where it runs one line and tells you, uh, would tell us 52 times that there was a missing variable, which is handy, um, but also annoying. So uh, this is like the end of the assignment. So now let's see what it wants us to do. So using this data set program, the different models of a multi-group analysis using ethnicity. Right. So I'm not perfect at this quite yet. So I'm going to look at my notes. But the next thing we're going to do is run an overall model. Okay, and that's the all groups model that we're wanting to fill in here. So let's do that. Well, to program the overall model, uh, what I need to do is write the model. Now I could pull this from before, um, but we're just going to call it overall model. Just rewrite it here. And that's going to be that the RS resiliency factor is approximated by RS1 plus RS2 plus RS3. You get the picture here. I'm just going to type this out. And you don't have to put these spaces. I just like things to look pretty. So just don't hit enter uh, because Levon interprets enters as new commands or variables, meaning it's expecting you to define a new regression or something. Okay, that should be all of them and close quotes here. So that's our model syntax for Levon. We'll do overall fit and program our CFA for the overall model. So we'll say that the model equals overall model. So we'll tell it what the, where the syntax is. Data equals master here. And then the last thing we also need to do, oh, mean structure equals true. Okay. And remember that's uh, important for this model because all of the other models will also include this mean structure argument. So we want to include it in our first model so they all match. I can save that. Now let's just check real quick that we don't have anything weird and it should match the model that we programmed in the longer example. But I just want to kind of make sure nothing blew up, right? So we've got our intercepts, which is where the mean structure came in. Um, no problems with variances. And then I could also turn on standardized equals true, R squared equals true, fit indices equals true, but I should be okay. So let me add that to my table here. Um, so we've built a, just a table uh, of seven rows and eight columns. It looks like I want them to include the chi-square, the degrees of freedom, RIMC, SRMR, CFI, the change in CFI, and a question over whether or not it's different. So an easy way to do this, remember, is to do fit measures. And this is different from when I did it before. Or I could just type these numbers. But if we want to be perfectly dynamic, okay, and then we tell it what fit measures we want. So in order, Away. It looks like I want chi-square, then degrees of freedom, then RMSEA, SRMR, and then CFI. Now in this first model, a change and a different score are in A's. So we're going to leave, leave that alone. And it actually has them marked where they should be in A. So let's try running this. Uh, and then it got mad at me. So one, two, three, four, five. That should have worked. Six, seven, eight columns. Who knows? Let's just try running fit measures here and make sure I did this right. I might have accidentally closed it twice. No? One, two, three, four. Okay, so I've spelled chi-square wrong. Right? This is why I don't do this from memory all the time. So let's see what that is actually spelled like. 
So I'm just gonna run the fit measures function, which is tons of them. And it's just chi SQ. So that's where I went wrong. Let's try this again. And let's just look at table currently. Okay, it's mostly blank. Um, I could also round all of these so that it doesn't print 6,000 decimals, but I think we'll be okay just for this assignment to print them all. Okay. All right, so that's our overall model. Now, what we want to do is program the measurement invariance models. And I definitely cannot do this from memory, so we're going to pull up my notes because uh, this is a new function to me as well and look at the new code from the equal test MI package. So I'm gonna cheat and I'm gonna just copy this and we'll talk about what it does. Boop. All right, so for this, we need the equal test MI package. What we wanna do is program a multi-group. I'm gonna fix myself, whoops. Thought I had turned that off. Good thing nobody said anything bad. Perfect. Um, what we'll see here, and I'm going to change it to fit to match the rules, right? So models are syntax, fit is fitted CFAs. Um, we've got this equal invariance, measurement invariance dot main is the function. We put in our overall dot model, data equals master. This time we're going to do group equals race test. And mean structure equals true. So these are the Levon arguments. We can tell it to print all of the output. Um, I'm actually gonna tell it quiet equals true. Because when you first get started, I think it's helpful to see all of the output. Um, and that by both, what you're printing is the means output and the covariance level output. Um, in this case, we're gonna actually focus on just doing the measurement model. So I printed them all so I could see all these different models. Um, but in, the, in this example, I'm just not gonna have it print all this output because we're gonna look at different pieces of it anyway. Okay. But you can see what that looks like if you turn off quiet equals false. So we're just gonna leave quiet equals true so we don't get all the output. And then this equivalence test I've turned off briefly because it's not what I had students do in the class. Um, and then we can leave adjusted rim C as true or false, but if you turn equivalence testing off, it turns this off too. Projection will give you the latent means projection test and gives you a Cohen C difference. And I didn't want to bootstrap. So we're gonna just run all of this. All right, so it gives me a little bit of warnings and this is where it would have printed a warning for every missing data point. So that's why I dropped the missing data. And from here, what I want to do is I could look at each model one at a time um, and look at their summaries. And this is what I'd recommend, but you can watch the longer video for that. So to keep this kind of short, I would show you, can we even tell if there are differences between these models? Okay. So what we can do is just come down here to our table, kind of add some little uh, stacking here, just so it's a little bit easier to read. Okay. Spread this out. For the white group, so now I gotta figure out which one's the white group and which one's the black group. Can we get the fit measures? Oops. Well, those individual groups are hidden under mg dot fit dollar sign conventional sim dollar sign Levon output dollar sign group one. So I'm going to have to look at least a little bit of a summary here to figure out which one it decided was group one. Okay, when we did a table of our race test, the first group that comes up is black. Thankfully our sample sizes are different. So once we look at the summary here of group one, we'll know which one it is. Okay. So here's the sample size. Remember degrees of freedom is unrelated to sample size. So here, this is our black group. So now I know which one's group one, which one's group two. And I could quick rule check, look at our variances. They're all positive, which is good. Okay. Could also look at group two. Group two this time. Just to confirm, yep, that's our white group. 
come down here, all our variances are positive. Okay. And I would look for the normal things to look for to turn on standardized output, look at all those, make sure there aren't any bad questions, etc. Okay. To stick the fit indices though in my table, I would do the same thing I've done here. So fit measures, but this is where it gets quite long. So we would type in the dot multigroup dot fit, conventional sim, well on output, group, the white group is actually group two, okay. then comma, and do this again. Okay. So I'm gonna hit enter, because <laughs> otherwise it goes on for days. And so now that'll print just for group two, which is the white group, our fit indices that we're interested in. Okay. So I hack all this, copy it, place one through five here. And the nice thing about making these tables dynamic is if we change, we figure out there's some typo in our data set, we can just rerun it. If we type the numbers manually, this is where we'd have to figure out you know, where to change the numbers. All right, so let's run those two lines and look. So I can run cable, table print, and we'll print. I mean, this is gonna look a little nuts because I didn't round any of these. But if we look at the overall model, remember there's some expected fit drop when one splits the data, especially into smaller sample sizes. And the fit actually looks better in a sense. Um, but for a group of 100 people, you just have to keep in mind that the uh, group with 300 people is probably a bit more uh, estimated better for their population. But either way, the fit indices are not terribly different. And so what we'd say is this would probably be an appropriate model that we could then explore the rest of the measurement of variance. Okay. Now we just have to find the rest of the steps. Okay. The next step is going to be configurable invariance. Okay. And that is stored under <laughs> combined groups. I just love how long these are. Okay. I can tell it's like stacked both of them together, which is good and there are no constraints, right? This is the pancake model. Where we've put white and black in the same model. Okay, the degrees of freedom will also double. Okay, so that looks pretty good. So to get that, we would actually just copy this, fill in here, and instead of configural group one, what we do is dollar sign, come on, and combine groups. Oops. So let's add that to row four and look again. So now we've got configurable invariance, which is our, do the groups show the same picture? Fit is roughly the same. So we're trucking along pretty good here. Let's find metric invariance. Right. So we'll do summary, multi-group, can't spell. Conventional sim, Levon output, metric invariance is actually called dot metric. Okay. And we now see that it's uh, constrained the loadings. Perfect, that's the model we wanted. I'm gonna go ahead and do the rest of these real quick. So then scalar invariance is labeled with scalar. So we should see that the loadings and the intercepts are constrained and they both have uh, labels here, which means they're constrained the same between groups. Good. And then the last one we want is strict invariance, which is where we're gonna add the constraint of residuals. So we're doing everything in the measurement model. And this is a tricky one. It's fit.strict.residuals. There are two of them that say residuals. But the one you want, if you're following the brown steps, is the strict residuals. Okay. And what we'll see is that all three are constrained now. Loadings, intercepts, and variances. Great. Let's look at the fit for those so we can tell if um, partial invariance is necessary. So I think I still have this saved. Yeah. So I'm going to keep cutting and pasting that fit measures, but I'm gonna fill in all the interesting ones here. So now we're on metric invariance, so I'm gonna do fit.metric. Oh, come on. Whoops. 
got excited with my tabs fit dot metric and there's still two variables out here that we have to decide on is if there's a change in CFI and if there's a um, a difference this is where I make students decide is this significant or not so to speak and I don't know yet without looking at the table so let's see what we can find here so I'm just gonna put in a one and two this is very temporary at the moment um, just so I can print out the table for all of us to look at otherwise it'll get mad that I haven't put enough numbers in So we've done configurable, let's add metric, scalar, residuals, print this out. All right, okay. this is the thing that displays very strangely sometimes, so I'm gonna blow it up here. And this now lines up a little better. All right, so is there a difference? So I could subtract my CFIs here. So I would wanna subtract metric invariance from configurable invariance, and then scalar from metric, and then strict from scalar to get those numbers. So a couple ways to do that. And I'm not sure I would know what one is the easiest. So what we could do is just print out this giant fit measures, but tell it to just give us CFI. It's probably the most obvious okay so what I want to do is take the fit measures copy all this for the previous model okay, fit dot configure uh, combined groups sorry the CFI minus the fit for the current line and then we'll tell us this is it different in a second and see if that made the little lines go away so now let's look at that table again okay. these become difficult to read once you start doing this but <laughs> is that different well it did the subtraction 0 0.09 I'm sorry 0 0.912 0 0.91 effectively 2 so I can tell now that that's not different okay we would say that that is invariant and we just want to do that again, but changing, I don't think, no matter how many times I hit enter, this is going to be hard to read. Changing these so that it's always the line above it. So for metric, I want to do metric minus scalar. And then we'll hold on our, is this invariant? And we'll do this last one too. So I want to do scalar minus fit. Oops, it's fit.scalar dot strict dot residuals. Okay, I still have them. Mm, it's still mad at me for something. I don't know what though, so let's find out. <laughs> Unexpected close. Should only be one. Now let's look at that table. All right, so is the change different here? Yes. Okay, so I, don't, I thought I changed this is different, but uh, I didn't run it. Oh, so this one is okay, but from metric to scalar, we've, lo we've dropped in fit. So what, how we would actually write this is that this one's invariant, this one is not invariant. And then this last line is still a question mark. So for line seven, it's currently not invariant, but that may change in a minute. So we may add some extra lines here in a second. So I'm just gonna rerun this whole table just so we can see the final product. Again, this would be better if I rounded it. So we would say that these are not invariant right? because they're greater than 0.01. All right, so let me fix that now. The scalar uh, invariance issue is the problem where we're at right now. So what CFI am I trying to get to? 
I closed that table, I shouldn't have. Let's just leave it open. So at the moment, I'm trying to get up to um, metric invariance, so this number, minus 0.01, which equals, this math here, 0 0.0, um, 0 0.9017, blah, blah, blah. Okay, and we are at, oh, it closed the entire window. Let's do view table print. There. Now we can see a little better. We're actually pretty close to that. So we really only need maybe one item because we're fairly close. So we're pointing 0 0.9017. We're actually 0 0.9011 or 12. So we don't have that far to go. So this is a fairly invariant. We'll see. Okay. And what questions would I freely estimate to get to partial invariance? Well, I gotta figure that out. And for this, we're also gonna cheat and copy my loop that I did before in the example. Okay. Mostly just so you guys don't have to suffer through watching me type all of this but I'll talk about what each piece does. So we're gonna figure out the partial syntax, and this one's different than the example that I've already done, so you can see something different here. Um, what I'm trying to do at the moment is I'm at the scalar piece. So for scalar, we're interested in the intercepts. So what we need to do is create the codes for intercepts. So the left-hand side is going to be RS1, RS2, it's the item numbers. And then the right-hand side is literally tilde one. So there's no other number there because that's how it represents intercepts, which is very similar to the way that like LM or if you're used to doing multi-level models, it's tilde one for the intercept. So what I want to do is change this to tilde one and actually delete all of that. So let me put this all in one line. This one will be a little easier to read all in one line. Is that I want to paste all of the column names, so call names for master here is just RS1234. I'm going to paste that with tilde one so that you can see okay, that what we're essentially getting here is just give me the intercept estimate for each one. And I'm saving that under this partial syntax name. To create a place to save all of my CFIs, I'm going to call a CFI list. And this at the moment is just account of how many numbers I'm expecting. And then I'm just gonna give them a label. And that is just so I can see which one is the one I wanna use. I'm gonna loop over these one at a time. So this is what the measurement and variance function used to do, but is no longer. And so I built a loop here. So the way the loops work is I have to have some sort of counting mechanism. So I'm gonna call my counter i. This just keeps track of what loop number I'm on. And then I'm gonna have it count up from one to 14. So that's the same code as here, CFI list. Could also use sequence along. I just really, um, like I said in my other video, I first learned coding on well, HTML, but then Perl. And this is just very similar to how that works. So once you learn it, don't, you know, don't break a wheel if it ain't broken, right? Um, don't fix it if it ain't broken is the phrase actually. Uh, so we're gonna loop over this. I'm sure there's some sort of apply or L apply or something we could do, but loops make sense to me. So I'm gonna loop over and I'm gonna run us one CFI for each of these intercepts and release them one at a time. So here, what I wanna do is fix this to be my new example. So overall model, master, mean structure equals true. Our new grouping variable is race test. We're not two residuals yet, so we're gonna take that out. Okay. And so we're gonna do group.equals only loadings and intercepts because we're on scalar invariance. And group.partial uh, is where we throw in the partial syntax. So this will allow it to estimate the model where that one intercept is allowed to do whatever it wants between the two groups. And then the next intercept, and then the next one. This is not additive, it's one at a time. So then I stick my CFI in my temporary list and print it out. Let's see what happens. Okay. 
So for each one, I now have the CFIs. Um, and I could match it to this number, but I just um, in, like want this to be as brainless as possible. So I wrote this little function. Let's see if that copied correctly. Yeah, so I'm gonna turn off scientific notation. I'm gonna tell it to sort my CFI list. So this will be uh, highest to lowest because I've got decreasing equals true. And then I'm gonna tell it to print out a, a subtraction of the CFI minus the CFI from that model. Um, oh, I didn't call it multigroup model. So this is from my other example. So let's just bleed it. Multigroup.fit, conventional sim, Levon output from the model we're on, so scalar. Okay. What does this tell me? This tells me the difference when I release that intercept how much of a CFI am I gaining? Right. And it sorts them in descending order. So you can see which one is the biggest problem. And that's gonna be intercept number four. So by releasing that one intercept, we're gonna gain 0 0.006. And we're already pretty close. So this might be the only one and it is double the rest. Um, so let's just do that one. So the answer to this question is RS4. Oops, <laughs> four exclamation point. To do that, what we wanna do is go back up to this model. I'm gonna call this underscore two for our second model. Everything looks pretty good here. Everything is the same, but what we're gonna add is, whoops, not there, here. It actually doesn't matter, but I'm gonna keep the Levon syntax together, group.equal equals, this is where you'd put in quotes, rs4 tilde, sorry, tilde one. So we're essentially copying, if I repost this, we're just copying this right here. Okay, the spacing doesn't matter. Okay, one till day only. Okay, gonna run that. Uh, oh, end of line codes matter. Group dot equal argument should not be included. What? Why you gotta be so rude? Okay, I'm gonna make sure that I didn't screw this up because this is what I did. Group dot partial. Oh, good grief. Let's try that again. <laughs> Yay, <laughs> now we actually have the answer. And what I'm gonna do is just add one more row to our table. So let's scroll up here. And we could just rebuild that table and say, you know what, we actually need eight rows. Rerun our table here. All right, it's looking pretty good. Actually, we'd wanna run strict invariance again. So I actually, let's go with nine rows. And you'll see why in just a second. And I'm gonna copy row seven just to now have to recreate the wheel here. And I'm gonna scroll down, close. Right. And now let's enter something for row eight. Okay. So what's row eight gonna be? Well, row eight's gonna be partial scalar invariance, it's, you know, using RS4. And then under fit measures, I want to uh, do this for sorry, mg dot fit number two. And now we want to do conventional sim dollar sign Levon output dollar sign. Now we still want to use scalar um, because this is the new scalar model. And we're going to do some subtracting here. So we're going to do um, the original model for combined groups minus the new model scalar. Oh, I'm sorry, it's not combined groups, it's metric. Perfect. Okay, so let me go back up and show you where I'm coming from. So for the line, the line that was scalar invariance, what we did was we took metric minus scalar and we wanna use the original metric model because that's what we're trying to get back up to, minus the new scalar fit. Okay, so 
So let's make sure I did that. It's the original models metric to the new scalar fit. Okay. And we'll see if this is invariant. So we'll come back over here, look at my updated model. And now by adding that one released constraint, it is invariant. Okay, so 0 0.005 is less than 0 0.01. So we would change this and say, yay, it's invariant. And now if we want to, we can copy all this and see if we fit the strict residual invariance. So it's gonna be row nine. And so we call this strict invariance. And I'm gonna leave RS4 here so we know that this is a partial fit. And so we're gonna do this from multi-group model two. Strict dot residuals and we want to subtract let me take out this one it's multi-group dot fit number two scalar okay. this is our partial invariance and then this is multi-group model two but I can make this even more obvious so you know which one I'm pulling from, from my updated model. <laughs> it just makes me laugh how long these are. Uh, strict residuals, let's see what happens. It's not invariant, oh, rats. So now we would do this whole process again <laughs> for the residuals. So we know that there's one bad intercept where are the bad residuals? So this is not invariant rats. So let's try again. And we're going to do multi group fit number three after I rerun this. So I'm going to do my partial syntax. This time I'm going to go back to the way I had it. So I'm going to do double tildes for residuals and then call names master four through 17. Okay, let's look, I'm just gonna overwrite this cause it's not important to keep. Now I've got the double tildes. These are the way residuals are written. Keep, keep using all this code, but now I have to update my CFA model. So this to me is where um, it can get confusing using this package cause it kind of hides some of this from you. But we do, um, group dot equal intercepts loadings intercepts now we want to add the residuals because that is the step we're working on and then group dot partial is partial syntax but also i now have to include that um, number four or i'm wasting my time here sorry close so i think the key here is to know that this is we've got to build so I have decided that RS4's intercept is no good between people and I would want to look at what that means, but I'm going to answer that question here. Um, I have to now add any other residuals that I think don't map. Okay, so we're exploring now a different step, but I need to add it to the previous step. Okay, so that's why I've got loadings, intercepts, and residuals, and my RS4, and maybe this new stuff. Once we've updated this code though, it should allow us to see the same thing. Print all that out. So now it tells me, oh, these are negative. So that's no good. Did I subtract the wrong way? Oh, I have to fix this. See if I function here. I was like, oh, why are they negative? Negative means the model got worse. All right, let's try again. So it's multigroup dot fit underscore two. This is the problem with cutting and pasting. You have to be careful what you're doing. Okay, what do we want to subtract from, right? We want to bring this up. We want to see how different it is from the residuals model in step two that we ran. Oops. And so we're comparing this to the original residuals. Now the residuals with one um, constraint released at a time. I'm like waving my arms around. So if you guys can see me, this is better. These are positive. So it looks like RS3 is not quite there. Is the, the one that might we might try first. 
So let's do that. Okay. So I have my little note there. We'll come back up here. Make this be round three. Add to a previous model, group dot partial here, add a new one, do rs3 tilde tilde rs3 okay, for the error term for that one. Otherwise, everything should be pretty good, except I have to close one more time because I use the. No, I don't. Why are you mad at me? Oh, I didn't have it open. There we go. Um, concatenate function where I have two of them that I want to exclude. I'm mad at me. Now we want to add these to the table and see how we did. So I'm going to go all the way back up to the top. I'm going to say, JK, this table needs to be 10. I'm going to just rerun my table here. I don't know why Markdown always locks up right there. I'm going to add rows 8 and 9 back. Copy row 9 just so we don't have to watch me terribly type. Here's 10. So now we have strict invariance, R is 14, and um, that's the intercept, and R is 3 as the residual. So I want to do this from fit model 3, but it's still the strict residuals. And I want to subtract, this is where I'm going to think, I want to subtract from the scalar one, model 2. But then I want to subtract model three, my updated model residuals. So I'm taking my updated model and subtracting it from the second updated model. In the table, this will make a little more sense. So let's just run that and see how that goes. And then to print this out, we would do cable, table print one more time. If I were to knit this together, I uh, don't use view, remember, because view will lock up your markdown sometimes, but let's see. And now, just by the skin of our teeth, this is invariant. That's why you don't want to round. Um, you want to, like, I could had, have decided this, I'd round it up, and I could do one more. And it might be useful to do one more. Um, but at the moment, this does come in under 0.01. Um, and I think you guys get the point here. But the hardest part, I think, too, is figuring out what to subtract from and making sure that your model that you're telling it to subtract from is correct. So I always kind of double check these just like plug and chug math. Um, but what we've done is we've essentially ignored this strict invariance one altogether. Like I would probably, if I was printing, if I was publishing this, take that one out because we didn't actually use it. What we did was we went from scalar invariance, which is subtracting from the metric one here to partial scalar invariance Right, and partial scalar invariance, we went to regular strict invariance, it didn't work, then we went to partial strict invariance. So what we've got is a model where all but two pieces um, is invariant. Okay, that came out very awkwardly, but all but two parts are invariant. So how would I answer this last question? Well, did I see a breakdown? We said yes. Okay, we saw a breakdown that the uh, intercept oops, for RS4 enter here so you can see a little better is not invariant which is a weird way to say this it's different okay and then the uh, residual for rs3 is also different okay. what does that breakdown imply well now i have to actually look at the summaries so what i'm gonna do is do a summary oops of um, multi-group fit number three. We can look at either one, conventional sim, either one for the intercept, but we really need the third one for the residuals. Qualify my here answer. So I'm gonna look at my final model, fit.strict.residuals, not means, come on, give me residuals. There we go. And then I'm gonna turn on everything. So standardized. Uh, 
<clears throat> I don't know why it's fit dot measures inside fit measures no dot on the outside but that's what it is so let's scroll through and let's find these bad boys so here's RS4 on our intercept and the first group we've got here there is actually a label blacks okay so for RS4 what we'll see is that blacks have an estimate of 5.1 but look at whites they have an estimate of 4 so blacks are indicating a higher number than whites. Oh, let's see, I have a scale somewhere on my computer, probably in too many places. TBH. All right, four. One, two, three, four. I am friends with myself. Okay, is this the right one? I can handle many things. Yes. So I am friends with myself. Blacks are rating that higher than whites, okay, on average. And then for the residuals, we've got RS3 here. For for blacks, we have three. For whites, keep going, keep going. We have one, so it's halved. So blacks are more variable in their answer than whites. On the third question, one, two, three, which is I usually take things in stride. So blacks are rating that I have friends with myself higher than whites, but they are more variable on I take things in stride. So what that implies and what I should probably write as my answer is just that. Okay. So we don't have to get too deep here, but basically for um, RS4, okay, just friends, uh, blacks are rating this higher than whites on average, which is the way we interpret the intercepts for RS3, which is the stride question. Um, blacks answers are twice as variable than whites. Okay. Now theory maybe might explain this, but for a class assignment, that's the kind of thing that we'd be looking for. Then if I were the researcher, what I would try to do is explain why this happened. Is there a model, some explanation for why these two particular items are not invariant across uh, racial groups? Right. And so that is an example of a multigroup model with two sections that would be not, con con you know, uh, you would do partial invariance for so you could see how to work the like an entire model. Okay. Come back for the second assignment, which is basically the same thing, but also covers latent means. So I've broken this into two assignments for this class, so come see part two in a few days.